me know and we'll get you set up. All right, Hi, Sean. Guys. All right, well, welcome to today is a Monday, Monday morning mortgage message. And um, I'm gonna get right into it because we have a lot of news coming out today. If you guys haven't seen right now in the market, what's kind of happening, um, hold on one second. There is a company out of China that is in a pretty big debt crisis. They're called Evergrande. Um, it's, sec it's China's second largest property developer, and they are $300 billion in debt. So I guess you can kind of can uh, make a, some sort of an analogy or a comparison to what Lehman, Mar Lehman Brothers um, did to our markets back when they had that debt crisis back in 2007, eight ish. Um, it's kind of the same thing, but um, we'll see what, what, kind of amount, what kind of an impact that will have on the markets. But if you look at the stock market right now, it is making a trickle down effect across the entire globe as far as the stock market. And if you followed anything that I've done in the past, you know that um, stock market and other things like this do have a pretty big impact on mortgage interest rates. So usually it's an inverse relationship. If there's bad day in the stock market, it's good for mortgage bonds. Um, and that is exactly what's happening. So I'm going to start right now and just kind of show you what's happening with those mortgage bonds. Uh, I'm going to share my screen real fast and then jump right in here. All right, so you should be able to see the candlestick chart for today. Um, I'm gonna kind of go over what happened this last week, but um, if you can see, follow my cursor on here, I'm gonna see if I can zoom in a little bit more on this, just make it a little bit bigger. There we go. So last week we were bouncing in between uh, these levels of resistance right here. Um, we had a good day here, we kind of, uh, we started low and we bounced up. We went through it and then bounced back down. So these layers of resistance, but on Friday, this was Friday, this big bounce lower. And um, I knew that on Thursday when we had this bounce lower underneath this level of resistance, we bounced this candlestick dropped. So the bond markets dropped. I knew that this, these Fibonacci levels down here would be the floor that we bounce upon. So if somebody came to their loan officer on Thursday afternoon and they say, yeah, let's lock. And it was down here. Um, or Friday, they, they locked down here because they were afraid the markets. They didn't know that this floor would be a big bouncing point. So it went below it and then boing, bounced right back up. So now we're in this position and we're heading northward to pass through these. Uh, this right here is the 100 day moving average. Here's the 25 day moving average. If we could pierce through this and get back into this trading, we'll get better rates. So right now we're carefully floating uh, to see what happens with interest rates and what happens with the market. Anytime we have volatility in the markets like we have with Evergrande right now, um, you definitely wanna float because we could see uh, a, a peak kind of up in the bond market where we had about two months or about a month back in August here uh, where we have a good ride northward here in bonds. So bad economy means good for interest rates. So let's just keep uh, watching that. For those of you who want to get an overview of what we, where we are with interest rates, Mortgage News Daily is a great website to go through on a daily basis if you want to go there. Um, this gives you an average of what's happening in the markets as far as the national average for interest rates. So the Daily Match Mortgage Survey, and this is across all states, this is nationwide, a 30-year fix just ticked over 3%. So we were below that for quite some time. Now we're right at the 3.03. That's on a standard uh, Fannie Mae uh, or Freddie Mac type loan. There's 15 years, almost in the mid section right there at two and a half. Uh, FHA is just above that at 2.65. And then Jumbo is usually about an eighth higher, right around the 3.1. So that's the national average. So rates are still really, really great, uh, but we really wanna watch to see what happens. And uh, yep, as we speaking here, it, it got a little bit better here, 17 basis points up. We were quite a bit higher for the day, um, let's kind of go over what the markets are doing right here in the market overview. Here's all the different bonds, coupons, bond coupons that are traded. Um, the 10 years at 1.31, this chart's interesting to watch as well. Um, so we, we went up, come on, you can do it. Show me this, show chart. It's thinking. You gotta love slow internet. 
Well, it's down six right now. So at 1.30 is the level we want to watch for. If it could pierce us through that, then we'll get even more activity on the positive four rate. Um, so right now, interest rates, guys, they're really good. We had a bad Thursday and Friday, but we bounced up like I kind of knew we would. I was actually praying that we bounced once we got to right here. <laughs> I knew we should, but it got kind of scary because we, we went kind of below those levels, which we could have happened had what happened down here. Um, but then we came back through. So make a long story short, rates are great. Really pay attention to what's happening globally right now because that could have an impact on rates for the better. Um, I believe we will get a little bit better rates. And um, we just had some surprise news last week with the economy as far as the spending. And I've, I've talked about this before. Guys, when we have stimulus in our economy, when we have checks being cut to families with, uh, for, you know, the, the, the child tax credits that are people getting mailbox money, uh, usually they spend that pretty quickly. And that's what stimulates the economy, but it's fake numbers. So once that stimulus wears off and we get back to reality, we're going to see the truth behind, it's almost like if you're taking NyQuil, it masks all the symptoms. That's kind of what a stimulus check does. And then once you get off all the medication, so to speak, you realize what health you're truly in. That's what's going to happen with the markets in the next couple of months. So we really want to keep a, a good eye on that to see what happens. And, but bad news usually is good news for interest rates. Um, so with this in mind, with interest rates in mind, um, I'm going to show you uh, a little excerpt on how interest rates work. And then I'm going to go show you how, uh, how to shop for mortgage in more detail. But before we do that, do you... Um, have any questions on what's happening with interest rates right now? Don't be shy. All right, I'm gonna jump right into then uh, kind of uh, what interest rates look like, how they change, and then um, I'm gonna show you what the pricing grid looks like on a mortgage um, when you're looking at the costs of rates. And then I'm gonna go right into how to shop for a loan so you can kind of see exactly how that works. So this is a breakdown of the costs associated with rates. So rates never change. You can always get a rate of 2% if you want right here. You can always get a rate of 4.875 if you want. Um, you can get any rate you want. The cost is what changes daily. And this cost right here, this 99.736, these zero points, what we consider no points is when that cost is at exactly at 100. So if you were to go right in between this rate, it'd be like 2.79 would be the um, an exact 100. But anything lower is a cost, anything above is a credit. So in this circumstance, the 2.875, this borrower would get a credit of 0.356% of the loan amount to pay for closing costs. And if you get this rate at 3.25, they'll get 2% of the loan amount to pay closing costs. Now, the opposite is true. You go below, you have to make up the difference to get to the 100. So in this circumstance at 99.736, they would need to bring in 0.264 to, in points to get to 100. So anytime you see points on a loan, it's because that rate being offered is below the 100 mark. So if you wanted a rate of 2% today on a 30-year fixed, you absolutely, absolutely can get it. And guess what? You're going to pay 5.709 points to get that. So it's going to be very expensive. Um, it's going to be very expensive. But you can get any rate at any time whenever you want. So when people say, what's your rate? It really is a really ambiguous question. I, I made a statement on Friday in a seminar that I did that. It's almost like in real estate, if you said, if a customer said, came to you and said, well, how much is a four-bedroom house today? Uh, well, it just depends, you know, it depends on where you're at, depends on the city, the zip code, the neighborhood, the square foot, all kinds of things, right? The same is true with rates. So uh, I'm not going to get into that portion of it, how rates work, but I am going to show you a little bit about how the deceptive markets and how mortgage, uh, inter, uh, mortgage companies can be very deceptive. So I'm going to show you what consumers see. And then I'm going to tell you how to empower your consumers when they come to you with a pre-approval with somebody else how to actually shop for the mortgage properly. So I'm going to show you, and this is at bankrate.com. There's nothing hidden here. This is just the straight truth on what's happening with when you go to see mortgages online, what's out there. So first off, let's look at this one, Amerisave right here. 
They're advertising at 2.375. Here we have points at 1.7 points. So consumers never see the points. Uh, here's one at 2.5 with 1.685, 2.62, 1.8 points, um, 1.6 points. There's always these points. Quicken is at 2.875 with 1.75 points. So a lot of people, guys, if you look at Quicken 2.875 at 1.75 points, and then you look at what we were at today, uh, just to give a quick, quick comparison here, at 2.875, we're a credit. We give them money. And whoop, where'd it go? And they were charging 1.75 points. So when you're looking at comparisons, you really need to look at what the points are that's being charged. Um, it's very deceptive when people look online, they say, oh my gosh, your rate at 3% is so high. I just saw a rate at 2.65 or 2.5. Well, yeah, you can get that, but it's gonna cost you a lot of points. So I'm gonna go over how to shop, how to teach your customers how to shop for a loan. Um, you can take some notes. I'm going to send this to you afterwards either way. Uh, so you can have a nice little breakdown of what that looks like. And then I'm going to answer a lot of questions afterwards as well, which I'm sure you will have. Um, so I'm going to get right into, I'm going to take off the sharing of the screen real fast. And I'm going to go over the different um, tips, I so to speak, on how to shop for a loan. Any questions on the pricing of loans real fast? Perfect. All right. So first off, you and I both know that when you have a good um, a referral partner, it is in the best interest of that referral partner to treat that buyer or that consumer with um, the best service possible to retain that relationship with you as a, as a referring agent. Anytime you're working with an outside lender, it's pretty much a guarantee uh, if they're out of state that the communication is going to be terrible. They don't really care about you. They're not going to send you loan status updates unless you beg and plead for them. They just really don't care about the relationship between you and the lender. So making sure your buyers understand that piece is important because here we, we want to retain that because like in my business, <clears throat> I'm referral only. Like I don't market online and leads and have all that. I don't, I don't have that. Whereas a Wells Fargo, those loan officers just get loans thrown on their lap and they really don't have any connection to them. I have you guys, I have my referral partners that I have to make sure that we're really taking care of. So we're gonna go above and beyond, whereas somebody that's just online is not gonna have that. So we wanna make sure our consumers understand that lenders referred by an agent have a vested interest per, to perform for that, real, that referral partner. Um, also, you all know this, but you know, this isn't a nice little PDF I'm gonna to send to you. But as a lender, as a local lender, there's a lot of local rules that we have, especially in Arizona, that outside lenders don't have to deal with. So make sure you're, one of the questions that we have consumers ask is, do you know what an LSU is to their loan officer? Do you know what a cure, what a cure notice is? Does their loan officer under, understand those two th things? If they don't, then they need to just run away from that loan officer because it can be just a disaster of a transaction. Um, so that's very key. Local lenders, whether it's the Prescott Flagstaff or Arizona or the, the Phoenix market here in Arizona, we all have unique um, properties. And Jenny, Angie, you guys know. And by the way, thank you guys so much for sponsoring uh, everything we do and for being such a good partner. But um, we all have different um, ways that we do business in different parts of the state. So we want to make sure that we, your loan officer representative understands that. Um, APR. Most loan officers, believe it or not, don't or can't under, uh, like articulate what APR truly means. So annual percentage rate is what it stands for, but it really isn't, it's not what the interest is based upon. The APR is nothing more than a representation of how many fees are associ associated with the loan. So if you see a note rate at 2.875 and an APR at like 3.6, there must be a lot of fees on that loan. But if your note rate and your APR are identical, that means there's almost, there's no fees for that loan. So APR is nothing more than a representation of what fees are associated with that loan. So if somebody ever says, what's your APR today? It really is gonna depend on what they wanna do. So it's not really a good question. So we ask them to ask their lender, 
explain to me what APR means. If they can't explain that, they need to run. And um, it's very important they understand what that means. Um, they also need to know what makes rates fluctuate. So a good question for a borrower to ask their lender is how do interest rates move? If they can't answer it based on the bond markets and their daily, uh, up daily um, effects of the markets and the economy going on, then they probably shouldn't be working with that lender. Um, the economic events that are happening, and I'll share with you some of them that are going on right now, um, but the economic events are gonna be very, very, very important to locking and the timing of locking your, your interest rate. Like as an example, the Fed is, is meeting and they're speaking this Wednesday. Um, I'm gonna be watching that like a hawk to see what they talk about. If they talk about inflation is hotter or they have to be afraid, I'm gonna lock everything instantly because in about an hour, the markets are just gonna get hit hard and the rates are gonna go higher. But if they say there's no inflation and it's really good news, I'm gonna float. So these economic calendars, these bond auctions that happen every week, the jobless claims reports that are coming out this Thursday, all of this has massive impacts on what interest rates we can deliver to our customers. So having a the borrower ask the loan officer how they determine when to lock a loan and how rates move is extremely important. If they can't tell that consumer that answer, they should not be working with that loan officer. Again, all this is in a PDF I'm gonna send you guys. So you don't have to write it all down, but you can take notes if you want. Um, so when getting a quote from a lender, let's just say last Wednesday, somebody got a quote from Wells Fargo and you saw the candlestick charts. We lost about 60 basis points since then. And then they came to me today and got a rate quote. Wells would be better than me today because the market's moved. It's almost like buying stock. You can't get a quote from multiple people with gaps of time in between to get a true apples to apples comparison. So consumers need to know that when they're shopping a rate, it needs to be within that very short window of like six or seven hours within the day. In a volatile market, our rates could change three times a day. So it's not flat, it's not flat. They move quickly. So when shopping rates, they have to understand, they have to get that quote within the same hour and a half, two hour period. So choose your three top lenders that you like, call them all very quickly, and then an hour and a half, two hour slot to get a true comparison of what rates are doing right that moment. Now, a little inside, if you have a lender that's out of state and they have a quote, and I'm a little off on rate, a written quote from that lender in a loan estimate form submitted to my corporate office, we should be able to match that quote unless it's just not even true. And we can smell um, BS a lot of times when, when we see these quotes because you can manipulate a loan estimate to say whatever you want, um, but we will price match. So most lenders can do this, um, but we're all gonna be very similar. And a lot of times we're better than most anyhow. So a lot of times we don't have to do that, but that is an option. Um, when you're shopping for an interest rate and you're looking at a loan estimate from two different lenders, one over here, one over here, all of the third-party fees like title, escrow, appraisal, inspections, HOA transfer fees, all of that is gonna be the same regardless of what lender you use. So the only two things that you need to, the borrower needs to be shopping for are the rate, the interest rate, which is the note rate, and the fees for that specific lender. That's it. A lot of people get, get confused and they say, well, the total closing cost on this estimate is a lot less than yours. And then I say, well, they have that title and escrow is only $500 combined. Obviously that's not true. There's you know smoke and mirrors. Look at the loan fees, look at the rate. Those are the only two things to compare when shopping for rates. So making sure customers understand this so they can shop properly is key because there's a lot of fudged numbers in estimates that are sent out by, by lenders. Um, it can make it look really good by saying, oh, the third parties, we don't know what they are. So just lowballing everything. And then their expectations are blown once they see the actual loan estimate and the people are upset. Uh, so make sure well, it's only two things, the note rate and the lender fees is the only two things to shop. Um, also, a lot of people don't know this is where consumers just don't know. And what they don't know, they don't know. It's just not their fault. It's just, they don't know. When you're getting a quote, 
a written quote, an email from a lender, that does not secure that quote. That quote is only good for that one second that that current came across the airwaves and went into that email box. That rate is just based on that fraction of time in life of what rates were right then. A lot of customers say, well, I already have a quote from two weeks ago, less. I'm just going to go with that lender because that's a better rate. That's not how it works. Rates move. So the consumer has to understand that if you get a quote from me one day, that's only for that day. It does not continue for two months. And then when you find that house, you can't lock that rate in because that's what the lender set. It doesn't work that way. So making sure they understand this is key to help them shop for mortgages. That's a huge, huge point because I would say 25% of all of my consumers think that the rate at the which when the, when the time they're pre-qualified or the time they got the initial quote should be the rate that they've locked the loan at. And that's just not true. You can only lock the interest rate in once you find a property or if you use our true approved program and the loan gets fully approved or underwriting, you can lock it in once it's fully approved and then you have 90 days to find a property and close. But locks are finite, they expire. So that's why you can't just lock it and go forever. Um, they only last a certain period of time. A shorter the lock period, the cheaper the lock. So a 30 day lock is a better rate than a 90 day lock. So keep that in mind as well. Um, apples to apples. If one person's quoting a 90 day lock and the other's quoting a 30 day lock, one lender is gonna be better than the other. So it's very important to have all apples to apples comparison. Uh, da, 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 da. So asking, making sure they understand the different rate options available to them is very, very, very important. So I'm gonna show you something real fast. I'm gonna share the screen again. When your consumers are getting rate quotes, make sure they're getting multiple rate quotes so they know exactly what they're getting. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen real quick. It's taking me longer than I expected to do this. So hold on one second. Share screen, share. All right, perfect. This is a mortgage coach total cost analysis report. In this one, I'm gonna actually show you this one. In this one, we've got three different rate options at the top. We've got a 2.875, a 2.99, a 3.125, and a 3.25. I can actually work this report live with the customer and then show them in a nice little easy to read format what the points are associated with all of the loans and how it works. So in this case, at 2.875, it's $4,800 extra, or it's $4,000 lender credit. And in, in between, there's a couple options. So they see their options, they know what that looks like. And then you can show them on this chart right here, what's the savings difference over a five-year period? What's the interest paid in 15 years? And what's gonna be the best for their circumstance? Just quoting a rate is a disservice to the customer. There's options. They need to know what's going to be best for them. If, it's a, if they're only going to have the mortgage for one year, they do not. They do not want to pay points. It just doesn't make sense because they'll never get that initial, in, the initial investment back. They just won't. So in that case, they might want to take the big lender credit and have their whole, all their fees paid for. So having a report like this to show to the consumer what rate is best for them is incredibly important because the consumers typically don't know what truly is best for them. So this is a total cost analysis. Uh, you can do a lot of different things. Another one is 20% down versus doing a first and a second with 10% down. Um, there's a lot of different ways of doing loans. Um, so looking at those in the short-term and long-term benefits is another great tool because it's not always just about one program and one rate. A good loan officer will make sure that they're advised on the different options. So. That's another tool on how to shop for a loan because they need to know what's best for them as well. So let me stop that share. Let me go back here. All right. Um, closing in 30 days. This is very important. Make sure if they're with an obscure lender that they know how much it'll, how long it'll take to close an actual purchase transaction when you're writing that contract. There's nothing more frustrating or quite frankly, embarrassing than going back to a seller saying, I didn't know the lender was gonna take 60 days. I know we have a 30 day contract, <clears throat> we need an extension. I know it's already been two weeks and we're supposed to close, but that's just kind of embarrassing. And it's just frustrating because the seller might say pound sand. Um, so making sure that we know how long it'll take to close is very, very important. 
Um, <clears throat> does the lender service their own loans? This may be important to the consumer. For those of you that have had mortgages sold, it's annoying. If one month it's Mr. Cooper and then the next it's First Horizon and the next it's something else, it's annoying changing all your bill pay, changing all of that. So if your lender services all the loans like we do, it makes it a little bit more comfortable for the borrowers. So I always make sure they ask that question because um, it is handy to not have to mess with that and, not, and know that you're gonna be dealing with that loan officer for the life of the loan. So it is a good question to ask. Uh, <clears throat> for you, those of you that might, might not know this, Quicken sometimes charges to lock your interest rate. If any lender that they're cut, these customers are working with is charging upfront for anything, they need to run away from that. That is not a good policy and most lenders do not do that. So if there's any charges upfront for rate, for anything, that is not a good practice. And I highly recommend not doing business with that mortgage company. That is not the way you do business in the mortgage industry. So anytime you have to pay to lock a loan, don't do it, walk away, go somewhere else. Um, so it should always be free to lock an interest rate. There's no commitment to any, there should never be a commitment for any fees at, for anything from a lender at any time until you actually close. So I'm going to make sure, they under, make sure consumers know that there should never be any upfront fees to the lender direct for anything. They should always get paid at closing and never any other time. So make sure they understand that is, is crucial. Um, also a float down policy. Uh, make sure they're asking, do you have a float down policy? If rates get better, will I get the better rate or am I stuck with the rate that you're locking in? That's important. Some lenders don't have that policy. Some do. We absolutely do. So make sure they're asking that as well. Now, the two last ones are kind of no brainers, um, but they sometimes aren't to a consumer. A consumer looks at the institution more than they look at the actual loan officer. But we all know the loan officer is the one in control. They're driving that ship. They are at the wheel. What they do makes a huge decision on what happens down the road. And if they're a brand new loan officer that doesn't know the 10,000 different pages of all of the FHA, Fannie Mae, Jenny Mae, all the different, v, every, all the guidelines, if they don't know that like the back of their hand, there could be potential problems. So make sure they're asking their loan officer how long they've actually been in business and how many loans they've closed. If it's, I've been in the business a year, but my company has been around for 50, I'd be a little bit hesitant. Um, if they've been around for 20 years and they, they know the industry in and out and they've closed thousands and thousands of loans, you can move forward with confidence. Um, it's the largest financial commitment that consumers make in their life. So they need to make sure that the person at, that, at the wheel knows what they're doing. If they don't, never take the fact that they work for a big bank that's really well known, that they bank with, that they think they're gonna get priority with because they have $10,000 in the savings account at B of A, it just doesn't work that way. So it's always up to that loan officer. So I teach them the questions to ask like this so that they can really get a good sense um, of what it looks like to shop for a mortgage. So I've, I've gone over a lot and I need some water because my voice is kind of getting a little dry. So hold on. All right, so I'm gonna open up the chat and open it to any questions you guys may have. Um, because there's a lot of reasons why people use certain lenders and it should never be because they're my friend's friend. Um, we all need to ask these questions. We all need to be really diligent because let's just face it, if the loan doesn't close, you don't get paid. So if, if you're gonna get paid, if you're gonna spend all your time setting up these searches, driving around town and with low inventory, it could be quite a while that you're driving around town explaining all the different you know, markets, going through the contracts, writing all these contracts. And if they don't qualify because the loan officer didn't know how to do it properly, that is frustrating. So your loan officer should really be your paycheck protection program. It really should. You need to make sure that it's a guaranteed closing when you have that pre-qualification in hand and it's not just done on verbal. And if it is done just on verbal, because it is last minute, making sure expectations are set for everyone that, hey, this is based on what they told me. This is not based on me seeing their documents. So know that going into this, that you may be wasting your time on this offer, but we need to get those documents in. 
and then knowing obviously how the consumer, um, how the shop for a loan is incredibly important. So I went over a lot. Any questions? Sean, I just have a quick one on your opening statement about that uh, developer that's so in debt. Do you yeah. think that that looks like inventory will be unleashed because the, their holdings were allowed in the United States? Do you think that means there'll be more demand in the United States because their holdings were in China? What does that kind of next step look like to you? That builder is not more just a resident, it's more of a, a, a huge uh, industrial type. And uh, they're like a, more of a conglomerate over in China. Um, so I think it's gonna have a strain on, the, on China's uh, overall markets, which will have a strain on us. But as far as um, how it's gonna impact our real estate community, I don't think it will have any impact. It'll just be more on the financial sector of that. Does that, make, does that answer that question? It does, thank you. Okay. Yeah, you got it. But we need to watch it because it's a trickle down. And the way debt works is usually people issue debt and then with the debt that they have, the money they get paid on that, they then reissue that and use that for their business model. If they're not getting paid, that means the people that lent the debt can't pay the person on the other side. And that has that trickle down effect so that the original, I mean, it could be a domino effect where one person's not getting paid, they can't conduct business. If they can't conduct business, that next person can't conduct business. That's why it's a trickle down effect when people uh, are insolvent like that. So it's gonna be really important to really watch what is happening um, with the markets today and the next couple of days with, um, uh, with that company. So again, it's called Ever, Evergrande. Evergrande is the name of that company. Our debt crisis affected much of the rest of the world. What's that, I'm sorry? I said our debt crisis, when, when that happened here, it affected oh, yeah. other markets a lot. Yeah, I mean, markets. it's we are a global market, guys. I mean, we are really integrated in a, in a way that a lot of people can't really comprehend. Everything's tied to everything in, in these big markets. Um, so yeah, um, just to let you know, the global debt is 300 trillion right now. Think about that for a second. Um, the US debt is 29 trillion. So we're 10% of the global debt. So there's 90% out there that we have zero control over. Um, now this week, there's some interesting things happening with the feds. Um, the Boston federal president is uh, being investigated now for insider trading. As you know, the, the, the feds have been buying mortgage-backed securities, buying and selling them to manipulate the markets. Well, guess who's been buying and selling and trading his own personal um, bonds and personal holdings? Uh, that's the Boston Fed president. So. He had 37 multi-million dollar trades of his own in this span that he's been in charge of, of doing the of trading on through the Fed window. So that is insider trading like I've never seen. So we're going to see if that has any impact on what they talk about on Wednesday. Um, but it's, uh, it's not a good thing when the people in charge of our money are making money on that. Um, it's never a good thing. But tapering is a big thing coming up. They're going to slow down the purchase of mortgage-backed securities. They're going to be discussing that on Wednesday. I think they're going to kick that can down the road. Um, the numbers right now that are going to be coming out, I think we're going to see a little bit tick the other direction in the in the markets. And when it, come, when it comes to the stock market, I think we're going to get a little bit of a, a push in the negative direction just because of this whole Evergrande thing. See how big that can get. But they're not expecting it to be a tragedy. But you never know. So really watch that carefully. Watch your holdings. And we'll see what that does to the markets. But it should be good for mortgage interest rates. All right. Any other questions? We went over a lot of stuff with shopping for a mortgage. Uh, I'm going to send that to everybody. Um, I'm going to make a little video on it as well. Uh, so that's something you can share as well with your customers. And um, not too many questions in the chat box. All right, so we're up 17 basis points right now. So that's, we continue to get better, which I thought we would. And we're up against a, a level of resistance on the 10 year. So we'll see if we poke through that and get worse. But 
we're in good shape, guys. Um, it's Monday. I'll let you guys get back to your days. If I'll stay on this call for another five to 10 minutes if you have any further questions uh, or need just to pick my brain, whatever it may be, I'll just stay on the call. So uh, enjoy your week. And I'll send you this little breakdown of how to shop for a loan so you can make sure that you take full control of who's in charge and who's part of your transaction. So thanks, thanks so Sean. Yep, thanks that, a lot. Guys. Thank you. Awesome day. It's going to be good to review what you um, send us. So I really appreciate that. Yeah, Thank not you. a problem at all. All righty. Bye-bye. All right, guys. Have a great day. Thanks, Sean. Not a problem. Sorry about that. Let me resend. <clears throat> All right, guys, I'm going to step off. Enjoy your week and uh, let me know if there's anything I can help you with.